she flew out of Chicago yesterday in inclement weather and had a unpleasant and long trip, but did manage to make it at the last on the last flight out. And, and it has been a great conference. Oh, good. Nice. Oh, I'm glad. And uh, Lynn's been struggling with laryngitis all week, and um, heroically is going to try to speak today. And Wendy, I think, is fine, right? Uh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> good. Okay, so we're going to start with Lynn. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Excellent. Sorry for the frog in my voice. Um, so I'm a, a biologist, and um, there aren't very many science classes that are available online. And for the most part, the reason is that most science classes have a laboratory component where the students do experiential work. <clears throat> and in order to do that, they tend to be equipment heavy. Frequently, you need like a microscope or a centrifuge or, you know, pipette and a variety of different things. And mailing those things to the student's house is really just not feasible, right? Yeah. So um, I'm teaching <clears throat> a class, Bio 200, Structure and Function in the Human Body. This is a class that's been taught in the biology department for a number of years. It was developed by Dr. Vicki uh, Connaughton, and she added some labs. So Bio 200 is a 200-level two, uh, class, and it is worth three credits, <clears throat> which means that it does not have a dedicated, organized laboratory component like many of our classes do. But what she did was to create labs that could be done within the actual lecture period. All right, so when I took this class and developed it as an online class, I kept many of those laboratories um, and have the students do them at home. The advantage is this is an anatomy and physiology class. They're learning about their own bodies, right? So who wouldn't want to learn about their own body, how it functions, and get to play with it? Right? That's basically what they're doing. They're learning um, a variety of different things about how their body works. And science is experiential. We learn by doing. So they're learning about their body by playing with their body, more or less, usually with someone else. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of fun. So I've got three labs that I asked them to do. And many of them actually do require a lab partner. But the lab partner could be a parent, it could be a sibling, it could be a friend, it could be a significant other, whatever, it works fine. Um, the labs focus in three different areas, though. So one of them focuses on the senses, one focuses on digestion and nutrition, and one focuses on cardiovascular and, er, um, systems. And the, the good thing about these labs is they don't require the equipment that I just mentioned. Basically, I, I, I create a list of the things that they need. They need a partner, they need sharpened pencils, they need a piece of paper, they need, they need to print out these eye charts. So they need to print a few things out, they need a ruler, but they don't need anything very extensive. And when I get feedback from the course, when I ask them what they like the best, frequently it's the labs. They like doing these things, um, they like telling their friends, hey, let's see whether you have a blind spot in your eye. And everyone does, turns out. You're supposed to, it's okay. Or, um, oh, I forgot my phone. I'll do this later. Um, I have them uh, purchase a, an app from the iPhone store for a hearing test. And it costs 99 cents, but it's a really great um, teaching tool because, uh, I'll do it later, sorry. I'm gonna you borrow your that? phone, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Um, it allows them to do diagnostics on their hearing, and they can do it for their friends and at cocktail parties and stuff, too. Um, so I'm going to end there, and, and, but I'll, I'm happy to answer additional questions, okay? Because my voice is funky. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Um, does anybody want to ask any specific questions about Lynn's example? Otherwise, we can have more open discussion at the end. No, okay. So, Christy, you're next. Okay. Um, your slides are right there in the same folder. In the same folder. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that one's yours. Okay, so. Almost it's over. Is that a little better? Can you hear me better now? Okay. So, um, my course that um, I'm using as an example for this was actually part of the Project Monitoring and Evaluation Certificate program. It's for graduate level or master's level students who have been through undergrad, um, working all over the world um, as uh, usually 
managers of nonprofit organizations or um, people reporting and, and being responsible for the proper allocation of funds. The course that um, I want to talk to you about today was qualitative methods. And so it was about um, using qualitative methods to collect the appropriate kind of data necessary um, for, for this type of project. And when you're talking about qualitative methods, you're talking about a set of soft skills, like interviewing. And soft skills are very difficult to teach in an online environment. Um, you know, traditionally, we think of soft skills being learned through apprenticeship, one-on-one. -on -one. That becomes a greater challenge as you enter the classroom environment because you're suddenly one person trying to teach a whole classroom full of individuals, and you go virtual, you've got a whole other set of problems. So um, we accepted this challenge, and we decided what we really wanted to do with this course to teach these soft skills was establish these goals. We wanted to make sure that um, our instructors demonstrated the proper technique through modeling. We wanted to make sure we provided an opportunity for students to work collaboratively on that skill development, to learn from each other. Um, but we also wanted them to be able to work independently because this is what they're going to do in the field, correct? Um, we needed a low stakes place where they could get credit for trying, but where it was still okay to fail. And we needed an authentic setting to follow everything up so that they would have practice in the real world. So that when they graduated, they are confident in their ability to do these things. So that's kind of a background of where we started and what we were facing. What we decided to do um, was to wrap this whole experience around a discussion board and a case study. So we um, built this discussion board around the scaffolded modeling approach. What happens is students first watch a video of the instructor conducting an interview, um, and it's for a mock research study but it is using a real nonprofit organization. While we were recording this mock interview, we made sure that the instructor modeled both best practices and worst practices uh, so that the students could see both in action and how that had an effect on the type of data that came back from the interviewee. Now, in some cases, um, the person being interviewed was so good at um, understanding even the misrepresented question that we had to uh, go back and ask them to react as if they didn't know what we were asking. And so we, ha we had to fake it a little bit. Um, and that was one of our challenges when we were recording it. But the goal was to get a sense of an interview in which both best practices and mediocre or poor practices were followed. On this discussion board then, students needed to watch the video and critique it. So their first task was, what did I see that the instructor did right based on what I've read about this in this week's readings, based upon what materials I've been given, based upon my own experience, what would I do differently, why would I change it, um, and, and what kind of data might have been affected by these mistakes that were made, what was done very well, why do I think it was done so well, all this type of, of rhetoric. Once the student has posted this critique, he or she then gets access to two things. The first thing they get access to is all of their peers' responses. So when they're in this discussion board, this isn't a general forum, it's uh, a post-first discussion forum, meaning you cannot see what anyone else has written until you have submitted your original thought. Once they have submitted it, they can now see and they can compare and contrast with how their peers critiqued it, which is a learning experience in and of itself. But the second thing they get is they get access to a follow-up video from the instructor. So this is the second video we recorded. While we were recording the first interview, we were taking notes of where it was that the instructor had told us she would be making mistakes. 
and where it was in the interview the instructor told us she would be delivering best practices. We followed up immediately with an interview with the instructor telling us what these best practices and the mistakes were and reflecting upon, in her opinion, how that affected the data set. And this video is then shown to students once they've critiqued, so they now have gotten their own critique, their peers' critique, and their instructor's self-reflection. Lastly, in the discussion board, right, discussion boards typically have two parts. You have your initial post and you have your follow-up. So the follow-up reply asks students to synthesize all of this new information. They're asked to compare and contrast what they did in their critique with what their peers did, with what their instructor did. Where were the gaps that they were missing? Where were the things that they found that no one else did? And was that a good thing or a bad thing? And what might they do differently now having this full rounded experience? What are they going to apply when they go out and do this in the real world? So that discussion board acts as their low stakes assignment. They get points for participating, they get points for having that reflection on what's happening. But the next week, their job is to go out and do exactly what the instructor did in the beginning. They've got to go out to a nonprofit organization, conduct a mock research study, and interview somebody using what they learned through this discussion board and the critique. So it was a really great way to incorporate case studies real world practice, and use a community approach to build soft skills. And I can talk to you more about the specifics of how we did it and those types of things um, later or if you have questions about it, but I, I don't want to take up too much of your time on that right now. Thank you. So, um, Lynn, do you want to do your demo now or do you want to wait till the end? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm hoping someone will ask questions or Lynn will do her demo <laughs> while I log on to my course. Okay. <laughs> oh, you couldn't find no, it? I couldn't. Oh. It's a difficult all right, questions while we're waiting. <coughs> uh, the uh, interviewer that you reported, uh, were they uh, uh, highly experienced? How did, you, how did you go about identifying that person to be able to model both the best practices and mistakes? So um, before we started, we made a list of um, what the course developer felt that the best practices were um, and common mistakes she's seen in teaching the class um, again and again and again over time. Uh, we also looked at a lot of research in best practices and she did have, ex like we were lucky enough that she did have extensive res um, experience in conducting research. So she drew from her own experience as well. Yes, they did. They did okay. Yes, and um, it wasn't submitted to the class because they were working, again, with real nonprofit organizations that they had identified in their community, so there were a lot of uh, privacy issues, but they were allowed to submit them directly to the instructor, and so the instructor would be able to see then their interview, their notes about the interview, and a reflection on the interview because we want them to also be reflective practitioners and, and do exactly what the instructor modeled. Let's take the interview, show our notes, and then let's reflect upon what we might have done differently if we could start over. Um, you mentioned the post search discussion environment. Is that through Blackboard? That is a setting that um, most learning management systems have. Okay. I do not know what it's called in Blackboard, but I have seen it in Blackboard. Right. Um, the example um, for this particular course, it was hosted in a Moodle-based platform, so it's called a Q&A forum there. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the correct term in Blackboard. Okay. But it, it is available in Blackboard. It is. And do you know what it's called there? No, but um, the other day I went to the demo of the new Blackboard, um, whatever things that it can do, um, and they were discussing it there. Mm -hmm. Was there one more hand up? Oh, okay, Wendy, are you ready? Okay, you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wendy Melillo from the School of Communication. Can everyone hear me? I thought what would make the most sense is to just point out within my course some of the things that worked really well for me. 
and I teach a course called Principles of Strategic Communication, which is the first course that you take in the master's degree program in strategic communication. And my comments um, will address two areas. Some of the things I was thinking about when I was designing the course, which I think is important because that gives you an opportunity to build some things into the class itself during the development phase. And then I will address some comments to some innovative techniques I used while teaching the class. And so the first thing I want to start out with is to admit quite candidly that I am a print person and I had difficulty grappling with translating the bricks and mortar classroom into the online environment. I found that to be particularly challenging at first. And when I started to think it through, through long conversations with the course developer, I realized that there are tremendous opportunities here that we just need to think about in a different way. So, to take something as simple as course introductions when you're on your first day, how would you handle course introductions in the online world? And there are, you know, you can post a video, there are, there are things you can do. But one of the things that I liked um, for this particular class was in discussion one, the students were required to actually post to an interactive map. Now, I will tell you that the longitude and latitude is not accurate here. This is not geographically perfect because in the early stages of development, we um, needed to come up with a way of pinpointing how you, you have a cluster of students in the Washington, D.C. area, for example. You need to spread out the dots a little bit so that everybody can see where those students are. So obviously this is not Jacksonville, Florida, but you know, you, you, we need to work on that next round. But what I liked about it is you could actually see visually where the students were. And then people did some interesting things. Some actually would post videos of themselves and actually do an introduction. So it was a visual representation using some mapping technology that was helpful, that I thought at the beginning. Um, to just kind of visualize it. So a second goal that I had was how can I use social media tools to actually enhance the learning environment? And that's another challenge because I'm not adept at every social media tool out there. And I will say you have to be willing to play. If you are the type of person that's willing to just sit down and play around with the technology, you will do well. I was fearless about it and I forced myself to do some of this. And when I did, I felt I had really good results. So, um, I used Pinterest, some of you may be familiar with, which is really an online bulletin board where you simply pin things of interest that you want to remember. So discussions were built around a Pinterest assignment, and then students had to pin that material, share that material with the entire, you know, every member of the course, and then write comments upon about other people's pins. We used Glogster, which is another example um, in Unit 6, and I'm just going to go back and show you if I can copy and paste because bear with me, I started in Engage 1.0. We are now in Engage 2.0 for those of you who are teaching in Dell Tech in the online system. So my course um, here is, is in the, you know, was designed in the Engage um, 1.0. Um, but in um, Unit 6, thank you, there we go. Okay, the history and future of building buzz. What we did is have students analyze a celebrity's image historically. And the, if it focused on a crisis, it often made the situation more interesting. And so this is the example of the Pinterest. Um, let me go back and show you. Sorry, celebrity. 
and entertainment. Celebrity image timeline is the Glockster. And so students would actually, Glockster itself is, think of it as a poster board. And you can use a variety of tactics from images, text, videos that you would simply put up on a large online poster board that would then give you a celebrity images timeline. And so if I just click on Sam's, for example, and you'll just have to uh, bear with me for a moment because I just need to copy and paste it into a browser um, so that I can actually show you how it opens. And I don't know how good some of you are at talking and grappling with the technology at the same time, but I'm going to do my best here, and I'm going to open up a new tab, and I'm going to go to, um, this will work for me, and Apple L, and I'm going to paste it right back in there. Hopefully I can open up this Glogster for you. And it'll take, Sam did Tiger Woods, and it'll just take a minute to load um, the timeline. But he was able to then trace Tiger Woods' image historically and through the crisis that Tiger experienced um, as a way to analyze strategic communication in a time of crisis. So again, this allowed students to grapple with um, the technology you know, in a different way, to, to bring that bricks and mortar classroom experience to an online setting that made it more engaging. And my last comments will focus on, if I can get back to my course, what I'd like to do is show you how I used avatars and podcasts, which is what I'm going to end with. Um, thank you. Where am I? Uh, right here. Here. Yeah. Thank you. It's always helpful to have somebody. Hmm. Okay, Max are so different. Yes, Max are different. <laughs> and I use a Mac. So avatars are, I don't know if you've ex gra um, worked with them, but I found them very helpful in the weekly, what I would do is I would do a weekly wrap up. So what's a weekly wrap up? At the end of the, of the week, I wanted to take the material from all the discussion posts and highlight one, two, or three students who I felt made um, comments that really highlighted what that lecture for that week was all about. And I would use an avatar and a podcast to do what I would call a weekly wrap up at the end of the week, as opposed to doing this at the beginning of the week before they had worked through all the material in that particular unit. So for example, the unit seven wrap up had and hopefully it will open here. Here is my avatar. <laughs> ah, doesn't look like it's going to open. How sad. <laughs> Basically, it is an image I got to make using a Vokey. Has anybody used a Vokey? Or have you even heard of a Vokey? I, I see a hand there. What's your experience been with a Vokey? There are six, they're basically they allow you 60 seconds. But all you have is a minute, but they're a fun image of yourself that is animated that I would use to introduce my podcast. Rhonda, you, you, you have worked with Vokies? And what I'll do is I'll go to the Vokie website and pull it up, um, and then I'll show you just that, that example. The other thing is I would then have a podcast. Pardon us. Sure. Mm -hmm. Technology. Mm -hmm. I would then use a short podcast. And we've, I've heard various um, recommendations on the length 
All right, so no more than 10 minutes. Five minutes is better. You can record up to 15 minutes. I used GarageBand. That may not be the best podcast mechanism for everybody. I was using GarageBand before they updated to their new system, which is very podcast unfriendly, um, I will say. But again, there's a number of podcast tools out there. And I found podcasts to be very effective. And I could get in material that I did not have in the lecture, but in a way that was able to wrap up the whole week, which I found useful for students. And I just want to go to Vokey. It's www, for those who, who may or may not be interested in Vokey's, it's www.vokey.com. You can register for free. There are very few free images, but what you would do is you would register, get started, register for a free account, and it, you hit the Create button up here, and it would allow you to customize a Vokey avatar. And you would then can see the possibilities here. For those of you who like to play with your image, you could do a variety of different things. You could put you know, glasses on if you wear glasses, jewelry, et cetera. And then you would record, you'd give it a voice, and there are various ways to record it. Upload the recording to the avatar, there's a way to post the avatar into a closed system. This also could be done for Blackboard as well. If you'd like to experiment with Blackboard, I have used this quite effectively on snow days, quote unquote. Um, with podcasts and avatars is the way I like to go. I think student and a discussion um, assignment that I think students find engaging as opposed to real time. The other thing that I used playing off of your discussion was in one of the assignments, um, I actually had students do a role playing exercise where one was the public relations practitioner, the other was the journalist. And then they had to switch roles, but they had to pick a topic that was hot in the news at that point, a crisis of some sort, and the journalist would interview that student. They would record the entire experience in Adobe Connect, they would upload their videos, the entire class could then watch those videos and, and do discussion posts making comments on them. I could see them and grade it. And it was a very useful exercise um, to enhance interview skills, media training, you could actually watch how you appear on television, so to speak, or on video. So you could see if you got your hands in front of your face and how that's gonna be a problem. You actually see how you react. And one of the best experiences I had was a journal, uh, the student doing the journalist decided to play a hard-nosed journalist and surprisingly grilled his poor colleague who just was unflappable. I was so impressed with her poise and her ability to just handle it under pressure. And I also found that to be a very useful um, experience. We have had various luck with Adobe Connect and Engage 2.0. Um, we're working on that, but that's another issue. But I have found that the more engaging I made it, the more fun, if you will, and entertaining is not a bad word in education. Education should be fun. It doesn't mean it's not rigorous. Uh, the better the results that I got in the in online environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so now I'd like to do two things. First, open it up uh, for questions for Wendy, and then after that, open it up more generally. We have three uh, experienced online faculty here who have really thought about how to make, you know, kind of find the things that we can do specifically online that we're not able to do in our brick and mortar classrooms and really take advantage of that. So um, other questions after that, but first questions for Wendy. Well, that's an excellent question. Um, it's, I didn't know this at the time, I was the guinea pig, okay? For our program, I was the first one, all right? So I was fearless and I selected things to use and the university is catching up with um, software that it supports 
and software that it doesn't support. So what you need to think about is when you're selecting software, say you want to just use Facebook, even in your bri bricks and mortar classroom, well, Facebook isn't supported by the university. Now, it doesn't go down a lot, but still, that's one something to think about. I, because I was the one doing the avatars, um, I was able to get support through our School of Communications. We, ha we are fortunate enough to have a director of online services in SOC, which, I do, which is really helpful. And, but just if the avatar worked online, I didn't have any problem with students saying I can't open it. All right, if anything, it was more difficulties with the Engage platform, and then we had a number of students could call. But we are thinking that through, because I've attended some of the community um, of practice meetings um, that Maika has um, sponsored, and we're talking through that very issue of how do you choose? So another good example is Panopto, some of you have heard of. I went to that um, session this morning, which I found very helpful, where you can actually v record and have a visual video of your PowerPoint in Panopto. And you can upload that to both Blackboard and the Engage platform. We've had a professor in SOC who's used you know, Panopto just that. I'm experimenting with it. I wanted to learn more about it. That is supported by the university. And so there is a 1-800 number, if you will, to call a tech rep if you're having a problem. Can I just add, the, so you know, one issue is bandwidth. So I don't know if all your students were in the US, but I think it's a, if, you're, if you're thinking about teaching online and you have students who are across the whole globe, you do have to think about whether they'll be able to have enough bandwidth to see everything you're posting and whether you want to try to make what you're posting less wide, let's say. Right. I did have a student in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, and yes, um, it, it was an issue of time. It simply took longer to load. All right, but we were still able to function. So if the, the, the student is more patient and you kind of explain that, I was still able to work with some of that. And um, yes. I'll comment on that a little bit too, following up. Uh, we actually had a student in Sierra Leone who had uh, internet that was way too slow to support streaming video. It just would not work. Um, and as you can tell from my example, uh, video drives the course. So what we ended up doing for him is we actually sent him a thumb drive with all of the media on it. And uh, we, we kind of did a workaround that way because it was the only feasible option for this particular student. But um, uh, in terms of scalability, I'm not sure what that means. You know, I think these things probably would work. Um, our concern was putting them in something that was so easily shared and, and not as, as tiny. You, you kind of um, are at risk of it being publicized a lot more easily. I mean, yes, they can copy things from the jump drive, but they have to take a few extra steps to do it. So we considered it, but we rejected it just for um, protection of our, of our intellectual property. The other issue is it really is a bandwidth problem. Yeah. You still have to download it yeah. from Blackboard, yeah. mm -hmm. so the student has to be able to start the download and come back in an hour before they then can watch the five-minute video. So there's, it, there's an argument in favor, but the scalability is the challenge there. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne had a question. So um, the programs that have partnered with Dell Tech are a little bit unique in the sense that the instructor is not all on their own trying to create this video. Um, you know, we are very fortunate. We actually have a media budget uh, where we get 
actual companies to come in and film us. You know, we have editors, we have, um, you know, a, a full slew of producers and, and media resources, which is fantastic. But that doesn't mean that instructors who don't have the budget or the extra hands on deck, it doesn't mean that you can't do media. Um, our process starts um, really several months before the course is live, but um, one or two months after we've started defining the, what the course is, um, we generally start out with uh, separating everything into our units and then figuring out what the assignments are, and then we create a media rationale table, as you will, that um, shows which pieces of media in which formats would be most important for the integrity of the course and the objectives that need to be learned. And we really focus on getting those pieces done first. And, and then that way, if we run out of time and something has to fall to the wayside, it's not one of these integral pieces of the course that it just can't move forward without. Is, is that a, a good enough answer? I, okay. <laughs> I can say um, I started six months in advance, so it was June of 2013 for a January 2014 course launch. And really, to me, the most valuable time was the several weeks I spent with the instructional designer in one hour com weekly, at least a minimum of one hour conversations. Now, I know I did this over the summer, um, but I was happy to do that. The, looking back, the most valuable time was in thinking through how to translate. Because this was a this is a course that has been taught for years in you know in this in SOC prior to my coming to the to the school. And how do you then translate that? That piece of it, that foundational work in the conversations with the instructional designer, were really critical because when I asked, well, what social media platform is out there that I can use to make this kind of an assignment work, she was right there helping me, well, Glogster is going to work for that historical timeline in the celebrity buzz, you know, unit. And it really made a tremendous impact right there. So really, it's it's how good are the instructional designers, how good is that relationship, and, and how willing are you to put in that kind of time? Um, because it's important. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is I'll start and then, okay. In response to your first question about the minimal tech approach, which is where I think you're going there, I would, ex I would try two things. One, I would try, I'm assuming you already have vid some video in the course development, okay? I would, right. I would add maybe podcasts. They're simple to do. And they're very effective. Students will listen, and it's an opportunity for you to 
all, it's not, don't think of it as a lecture, think of it as just augmenting or highlighting the takeaways. What do you want those students to take away from that, you know, lecture or unit that week? Which is why I liked using a podcast for the weekly wrap up. Okay, that, that was very helpful for me because I'm assuming you already have video. The second thing I was gonna say was Panopto, but you're already using it because I think that that's a, a basic approach that uh, includes both audio and visual, the video. And it is supported by the university and you can get courses on it at CTRL and here and, you know, that. Th so that would be my answer to your first question. Your second question is more challenging. Um, I think, it really is about engagement with students, right? Where I found the, the, the greatest challenge to be and what worked for me was I could not respond to every discussion post. I was not gonna be in the middle of that. I think that actually made it less effective rather than more effective. Plus, I also think that creates a very burdensome teaching kind of environment for my particular style. It works very well for other professors. I think you have to decide that in terms of what works well for you. So I found that I was able to emphasize the points I wanted to to, to, to enhance critical thinking in my weekly wrap-ups as opposed to getting into back and forth. Because you told me at the onset it was a minimalistic you know, kind of approach, you know, that, that you were interested in with technology. Um, so perhaps not, not, not feeling like you have to insert yourself into every discussion um, is something that would be helpful. And, and then using like a podcast in a, in a very simple way at the end of the week. Like that would be my response. You want to take a sure. crack at that? So, um, the way I would answer the first question is probably not an answer um, that you're looking for, but it would be, don't worry about the tools. It would be, think about the assignments that you have, and is there something missing from that assignment? If there is, identify what that missing piece is. What is it that would help students take this to the next level and find that tool. For example, um, we were doing an assignment, um, kind of, it was an introductory thing, just trying to get a feel of where students already were in this program, um, what their perceptions were coming into a course, what they thought the course was going to be, um, and, and kind of what they were wanting to learn. And um, we were trying to figure out how to keep this from being kind of this boring list of each student sticking together like by, by themselves being like, oh, this is what I want to learn. Oh, well, that's what Sally wants to learn. We wanted it to feel coming in from the get-go like a community, and it just wasn't feeling that way. So we thought, well, a visualization of the overall wants and needs of the students as a whole would be really great. So then we went out and looked for a tool that would help students visualize that, and we found word clouds. So we ended up having students um, make a community word cloud that then showed which terms, you know you, you know how word clouds work, I'm assuming everybody's used them. The ones that are used most common get real big and the ones that are only used a little bit are really tiny. And it was fantastic for the course. It really helped students visualize where they were as a class and then they could compare their con contributions to the class as a whole. So rather than looking at the tools and saying, how can I fit this into my course? I encourage you to look at your course and say, do I need a tool to help my students here with this particular thing? And one, um, I think, misstep that I see a lot of new online instructors do, uh, they are very excited about the technology and they are worried about it being too text-based. And so they insert too many tools and it does become overwhelming to students because they're like, wait, I was just in Vimeo and now I'm on you know, Vokey and now I'm doing Pinterest and now I'm doing, so you have to really be careful about are you trying to teach students technology mm -hmm. or are you using technology to teach students? 
Um, and in, in Wendy's case, you know, her course, she does need to teach students the technologies of social media a little bit because that's part of what they're learning. So she can get away with putting more in there uh, than maybe in an econ course. Um, and then in answer to your second question, I know I'm being long-winded here. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, the, um, I agree with what Wendy said about the discussion boards, letting them breathe sometimes helps the, the conversation flow more effectively. The other thing um, that has been very effective for instructors is to maybe hold one or two optional synchronous sessions and, and let students vote on when will you be available if I schedule a synchronous session in week three, what day would be best for you? What time of day would be best for you? And then you pick the time that works for the most students, you record it, and, and unfortunately the students that can't be there can't be there, but usually those that can are very interested in a synchronous session and they will make it a priority. Lynn, do you have anything to, to add? Respond. So I actually keep my online class very kind of low tech, I guess. So I use just the basic things that you mentioned, Panopto, Blackboard. Um, I point them in direction or ask them to look at videos that um, demonstrate um, mechanisms of the, the body systems that we're covering in that particular week. Um, but I don't use most of the, the technology that has been described here today. Um, I do ask them to purchase an app from the iPhone store, which is what I meant to bring, um, which tests their hearing, but that would be the only additional app I bring in. Um, my course is completely asynchronous. Um, I ask them to engage with the, the information. There's not as much um, engagement with each, each other as there is in, in the other courses. You know, I wanted to actually add one thing too, which is just uh, YouTube. There is so yes. much stuff on YouTube that you can, you know, bring in and post links to, and students use that you. A lot of things you don't have to make yourself. I mean, actually, this is an odd example, but I had a 45-minute video that's old. It was made like in the early 1980s, and I think it's still really the best thing on this topic. It was only available in you know film on a big reel here in the library and for some you know copyright reason they couldn't actually put it on a disc and it was just a disaster and I ended up not showing it anymore because you know I can't deal with reel to reel whatever that reel you know big thing anyway um, but a student of mine found it on YouTube and it had been carved up into 10 minute slices and which is even better right because the students can watch it in pieces when it's convenient for them so it's amazing what can be found there, um, and, and that is so easy to, for everybody to use. We all know how to use that already. Yeah, most of the videos I ask them to look at are too. And some of the, t the t tools that I use only require the students to click. Click on the avatar, click on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's requiring a lot on their part. may not be the best mm -hmm. the receiver end is <laughs> um, I, I you would be amazed at what's out there I can't I don't honestly know um, but you know part of it is you're working in a closed system like engage so you you have to or blackboard these are closed systems for the privacy mm -hmm. security reasons mm -hmm. so you know there's that aspect mm -hmm. and and when you're talking about making things downloadable so they can listen on their phones mm -hmm. Um, one of the, I guess, pedagogical concerns that arises with that beyond the um, information privacy stuff is if they are multitasking, if they're listening to it on their drive, if they're listening to it while they're running, are they really absorbing the information? And do we want them to be multitasking while they're listening? And so that's not necessarily a yes, do it, don't do it response, but it is something to always keep in mind when you are doing things for the convenience of your students, are you making it so they can be passive? Because we always want them to be active. We have time for like one or two more questions if anybody has one, yes. Just a quick follow-up. What software would you use for making podcasts? I used GarageBand, but I have to 
Well, it, it's a lot. I, I went to YouTube and found a video on how to, <laughs> to do <laughs> podcasts in the new updated version of GarageBand. But there's, ex, ex, yes, Audacity. Audacity is the yeah. other one. Audacity is the PC version. All right. GarageBand's the Mac Ed, version. Right, and I, yeah. And I'll tell you what, guys, I use my phone. That's you could just record video. your voice. <laughs> yeah. That's, the, you yeah. know. I use my phone, and then I download it. I use, like, Voice Memo, and I, um, I'll simple. put in, like, my little, you know, microphone earbuds, and it picks up really nicely as long as nothing else is in the room. It's cheap. I don't have to download anything. <laughs> simple, low tech. <laughs> Same thing with video. If I if I'm doing just a, a you know webcam announcement type video, you know not a professional instructional one. But if it's just a summary, uh, you know I'll either use my webcam directly from my camera and use a nice microphone because the webcam the the computer mic doesn't pick up very good sound. So have a good microphone, or I will again use my phone and set it on something stable, you know like tripod something. And, and just record it that way. Students um, would rather see and hear you than have an amazing video. So if it's the choice between doing a simple, basic, low-tech video or doing nothing at all, I'd say go for the low-tech. And Actually, I don't remember where I was yesterday, but someone was reporting research that shows that students much prefer something that's more casual. So if you're choosing between, like, putting on your tie or whatever it is and sitting you know in a really formal environment um, and providing something that seems very professional that that's not actually what they prefer and they'd rather have you in an armchair especially you know if you're doing the wrap-up and not mm -hmm. something technical where you have to be moving graphs in my case right um, that they much prefer the more casual version which suggests that the your phone might work perfectly well and it's more intimate you know they right, they feel it, like right. they're in the classroom with you you're recreating that kind of experience, and I like that. That's why I like podcasts. I find them incredibly, you know, engaging and intimate in that way. Uh, one more question before dessert. Can I add a follow-up comment? Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> follow-up comment about the um, podcasts. Uh, another thing that I have heard as being very successful, we haven't used it in any of my courses as of yet, but I'm going to keep pushing it as an idea, um, is the idea, um, I just went to a conference, somebody was talking about it, sounded great, doing essay feedback as a podcast. You can get a lot more in, you can explain, you have a tone for context, it doesn't look like somebody's just bled all over their paper, uh, and students... Uh, respond to it very well according to the research that's been done on it. So I don't have personal experience, but I look forward to having personal experience with it in the future. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. I was just going to mention the new uh, PDF with the comment feature is allows you to do an audio recording. So yes. I mark up their document nice. and I will put audio in there when I get tired of writing. Nice. <laughs> nice. Very right, nice. Or if it's going to be really long, you right. know, yeah. Right. And just record the audio. It makes a bigger file, but And I'll, I'll add one thing. Teaching in the online program has revolutionized my grading. Now, what, what I did was, you know, I graded everything by hand. I am now using, it's an iPad app, but it's called iAnnotate. And it allows you to highlight. It allows you to write in with your finger words. It allows you to type in words. All of my grading is now done this way. I think I would like to experiment with the, with the verbal essay feedback kind of approach. But I save an incredible amount of time, number one, but I'm also providing even more feedback than I did is it, if I was writing it out by hand. So I have my iPad with me. If anybody wants to see, I annotate after the se session. I'll be happy to show it to you. It costs 10 bucks, 10 bucks to buy it. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more last words? Resources. Oh, 
okay, so just one uh, thing is that we did, I did already post um, some materials to the Blackboard site for this session, and um, people who haven't done a little how-to are going to send me something that I can post there. So I think I have Christie's maybe already, but not uh, from the other two yet. So I will post those. I don't know if you have any, if, I don't know if you're still sending something, but if you want to add any little list of your favorite resources, maybe that would be helpful. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. I think we should develop a university-wide resource. Yeah. Center, but some something, center mm -hmm. but that's something going forward that I think we all need to work on. It does. Yeah, Keeping up with it. Yes. Are, I know. Years, I know. Right. Or maybe yeah. one year even. Maybe right. One year. Yeah. So I, it's hard. It's hard. It is. <laughs> right. No, but I do like the idea of a, a university online database for people of um, little examples and and links and so on. I think it's a really great idea. We can work with CTRL. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. right now we're working kind of parallel, but we could work together. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for the great questions and comments. Thank you.